Hi everybody, Richard again here from Electric Classic Cars and welcome to today's episode. It's all going to be about the race car. Yes, boys and girls, it's time to update you on Project Buffy and what we've been up to. So it looks a little bit different from the last time uh, uh, you saw it. So let's just dive straight in and talk about the battery packs first. Now, I'm, this isn't a Flintstones car. I'm not going to be pushing it along like that. This is where the Tesla motor is going to sit in the rear. But as we mentioned in the previous video, what we've done, we've flipped it over. And we've already sorted now the oil scavenging system to be able to pick it up off what was the roof of the interior of the gear reduction unit. And that now is ready to slot in here. So all the fabrication is done, all the mounts are done, and the fabrication guys have been busy on the battery boxes. So they've kind of finished them, I'd say about 90% finished now, and the, the mounting points are all in-ish. I think they've got to add two more here. Um, and the electrical guys, that's uh, me on this project, have been getting our teeth into essentially where all the plugs and cables are going to be going. So um, just to recap, what we've got is three battery packs in this. Um, it's using LG Chem modules, really high C rating. Uh, C rating is how many amps those modules can provide, and amps means peak power. Um, so each module can actually give 800 amp peak power, and there's six of them in series in each battery box. So total, it's a 6S 3P configuration. That's six modules in series and uh, three of those you know, packs, if you like, in parallel. So 6S 3P. So you've got six um, of those LG chems in that one there, six in that one there, and six in that one there. Now, as I mentioned, they're 800 amp peak. And if you put them in parallel, they're kind of sharing the load, a little bit like three blokes like lifting something really heavy. They're all sharing that load of the weight, same with amps. So uh, 800 amps, that's 2,400 amps peak they can cope with. Now, if we think about how many amps peak the Tesla Motors can uh, grab off those battery packs, it's going to be, I'd say, around about 1,800 amps peak. So we're well below that, which is a good thing. So we're not overly stressing the battery packs out. Um, so fabrication guys have been busy and what we've started to do now as you can see we've got some of the um, high voltage amphenol plugs on so this one here uh, you'll have the cables going out and down below there and then coming back to uh, bring in uh, this battery pack here. Same the other side and there's some underneath here as well and if we lift this up and pass this to my glamorous assistant Tim. Grab that mate. Ta da! Hold on. So now you can start to see some orange cabling. So now you know uh, the electrical guys have got their teeth into it. So what we've got in here is all of the main contactors and um, the only thing we're kind of having uh, electrical wise, apart from battery management systems and stuff, in the side uh, battery packs are obviously a main fuse and a contactor and, and other uh, bits and pieces in there but this is kind of where most of the stuff is happening so we've got our pre-charge system our pyrotechnic um, or pyro fuse if you like uh, main um, uh, fuse in there um, you've got some other bits and pieces for DC converters um, another fuse in here main isolator obviously so that's going uh, inside the cabin so we've got access to that from a safety point of view and also the main uh, contactors will also be uh, fired open um, from a remote external um, uh, switch as well for safety purposes. Um, now there's no chargers on this car, don't forget. We're going to have external chargers, so we don't need to bother about chargers, but we will need a DC to DC converter just to keep the 12 volt side of things alive. Um, but this is kind of what we've been up to and trying to figure out where everything goes and uh, we kind of got it now. So this is just a, um, I'd say, a, a last dress, dress rehearsal, if you like, of where the cables are going to go, where the bus bars are going. And then from this now, we'll start finishing this off proper and then putting in some cable management just to keep the cables in the right places and keep them all separated. So that's the electrical side of things. What should we cover next? I'm going to get in it, actually, and show you uh, the seat and the steering wheel, because I don't think you guys have seen that, and see, actually, how difficult it is to get in. So let's have a look at that. Right, time to try to get in. And it's fair to say this isn't your average family car. Um, 
It's more like a, a single seater, really, because uh, essentially you're, you're surrounded by two side pods here, if you like, and you've got that central seating position. Uh, we've got a beautiful carbon fiber tillet race seat. But the other thing we've got as well, it's a little bit Formula One-ish, is uh, removable uh, steering wheel. So that will make it a lot easier to get in and out of as well. So if I put that over there, and we'll, uh, we'll try to get in. Graceful this will not be. <laughs> So, resting on there, get your legs in, and then plonk yourself in. That wasn't so bad. And then, oh, with the stick, whoa, this all, already feels racy. I like this. That's a nice driving position. So, there we go. I'm in, and it feels really nice and comfy. I mean, uh, you know, as I say, it just feels like I'm in a race car. I've gone straight into race mode, because essentially it just feels like uh, a single seater and uh, yeah like it obviously you're going to have the harnesses coming down here and uh, helmet on so there's enough room for for a lid but yeah all right let's crack on what next uh oh i know drive shafts let's call it, let's talk about drive shafts because this power this car's got a lot of power going to those wheels so let's talk about drive shafts Right, let's talk about the differences between a road car and a race car, and uh, drive shaft is kind of one of them. So this is um, the original drive shaft system that was on this vehicle, and it's off a of Golf Mark II. Um, so this is your drive shaft here. So obviously this goes into your engine, or gearbox, I should say, but now in case it's going into the electric drive unit. And then that spins like that, and then you've got your wheel and hub attachment sort of like here. Now, um, this was uh, attached in there. So, I mean, if I slot that in there now, there you go. So that all goes on there, and you can imagine a wheel on there, and then you've got your hub carrier here, which kind of it all bolts to. The problem is, that was designed for a Golf Mark II, and now we're going to be putting, especially at the rear end, around about 600 horsepower through uh, that drive shaft and that, that hub and everything else simply isn't up to the job. So we ha then had a challenge of, um, you know, we, we want to keep these lovely, um, strong billet aluminium hub carriers, but how do we then go to something that's going to be able to cope with the power? And luckily in the VW Audi sort of uh, range, there are cars like the uh, Audi R8 and the Audi RS6, which um, are fairly similar. And uh, what we managed to do I split this off here now. This uh, just pass me that bearing there, Tim. So this all attaches um, to your your bearing, if you like. And essentially, all that is is um, a bearing inside, um, you know, a, a bearing carrier, and that kind of sits on the hub carrier there. <clears throat> just about to see that. And when we started looking around. Um, what we obviously wanted was something with a bigger internal diameter so we could fit a bigger CV and, and um, hub to it, if you like. So essentially, that is what we did. We managed to find exactly the same bolt pattern there that bolts on there, but with a bigger bearing in that could then accept one of these bad boys here. And it's kind of already on there now. That uh, essentially is an Audi RS6 uh, drive coupling there if you like and then on the outside then um, it, would, it wouldn't fit uh, the Audi um, RS6 uh, one but the Audi R8 one did so it's kind of an Audi RS6 inner Audi R8 outer and now you can compare the two on the floor here now I mean the size difference is pretty immense um, so that'll be able to cope with a lot more power and just look at the drive shafts alone you, you can see the thickness there from there to there is uh, quite substantial. So in essence, we found our solution now for the drive shafts, front and rear. So we've upgraded the motor combination of Audi RS6 and Audi R8 that just bolted straight on to these hub carriers, which uh, is fantastic. So now we've got the power to the wheels. The other thing we're gonna have to do is stop the vehicle. So. I'm going to grab some parts and show you essentially what we've done to upgrade the brakes because Golf Mark II discs were not going to work on this. So we've had to go big, and I mean big. So let me grab some stuff and actually we'll may as well put it on. 
Right, let's talk about brakes, as somebody used to say. Um, with great power comes great responsibility, and I'm pretty sure he's talking about brakes. So what I've got on the floor here is kind of a good comparison between um, you know, an OEM sort of like uh, average car brake system versus pretty much race setup. Um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is the actual discs or the rotors. Now, if you compare the size between this one here and this one here, obviously this race one here is a lot bigger diameter. And the further you go out from the center, the, the less braking force you have to exert on the disc to get the actual same braking on the, on the wheel. So it, it's kind of like leverage, if you like. If you're trying to um, uh, use a wrench on a, a stuck bolt and you've got a, a spanner this long, you'll find uh, if you put an extension on it, essentially to about there, it'll be less effort. Same with brakes. So the wider the rotor, the, um, the better braking essentially that you get. Um, so that's the discs themselves. The other thing to mention about these discs as well is they are ventilated. Same as these discs here, but obviously these have got a lot more ventilation. And if I turn it around there, you'll see there's kind of an impeller here which sucks the air in there and then blows it out there as the disc is rotating. Because obviously as the pads are forcing themselves onto the discs, you're going to get a lot of heat buildup from friction. So you want to be able to dispel that uh, heat and dissipate that heat if you like. Um, the other thing you'll also see here is these are cross-drilled. That helps uh, with water dissipation as well. So that's essentially to get rid of any water that's on the actual discs themselves as well. So if I put that back down there. Oh. Now, so that's the discs themselves or the rotors. Let's talk about the other side of braking, which essentially is the calipers. So what we have here is a beautiful piece of engineering from AP Racing. It's a Pro 5000 caliper and it's got six pots in it. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six there. So these pistons essentially just close up the pads onto the uh, disc itself. It's aluminium, it's, it's lightweight, and it's got a lot of you know, uh, pressure um, to apply to, that, uh, to the pads and disc because, uh, because of those six pistons. So that's essentially the, the caliper that we're gonna be using. And if you compare that to this, this one here, two hands because it's heavy. This is a kind of an OEM one. This is an Audi A6. This is a single um, piston in there and it's a floating caliper um, but it's a lot lot heavier and it's going to have nowhere near amount of clamping force as that AP caliper down there. I need to go to the gym. <laughs> um, so uh, that's the braking setup that we've gone for on the race car. Um, and it should, we should also mention the fact that we have a, um, a caliper mount that we've had to custom design and, and manufacture um, from Billet Aluminium to be able to mount this caliper onto that hub carrier because that hub carrier obviously was designed for a different um, disc and, um, and caliper setup. So this essentially uh, allows us to bolt on that caliper. And that's what we're going to do next. Now... The first thing we're going to do is put on this beautifully engineered caliper hanger. I don't know if you can pick that up on camera, but that is a piece of engineering art right there. So let's get that on first. Um, it's fair to say this is not the last time this is going to be going on. So uh, if it was, we would be torque wrenching and lock tightening galore. But I'm just going to nip these all up for now, just so you can see how it all goes together. So that's that one, and bottom bolt. So the caliper hanger is kind of a conversion uh, device, if you like, to enable us to uh, mount the aftermarket caliper to a hub carrier that was not initially designed for it. And it's quite a common thing that happens on uh, modified vehicles. So that's the caliper mount on. I think next thing we're gonna do is put the rotor on. So just get that in place here. Get one bolt in because it's quite a weight. Okay, so another thing we need to do as well at a later date is we need to drill and tap a locating bolt as well because uh, usually what you have 
is at that point there. There's normally a hole, drilled and tapped hole, on the actual hub itself to be able to mount the rotor to, but that's not the case at the moment because this disc obviously is not designed to go onto that hub. So it's another thing we'll have to do, but it's got a, a um, it has a uh, bit machined onto it that centers the uh, rotor, so it's definitely uh, designed for this rotor, it's just not specifically where the mounting bolt goes. Okay, so that's the rotor on. And lastly, caliper. So if you get the pads in, real simple way to actually put the pads in on these, it's just essentially you just slot them in there, nice and simple. And in they go. Let's feed that in there. Hang on, have I got this around the right way? No, got it right around the wrong way. Let's feed that in there, like so. That's in from the back. There we go. And the bottom one. Nip them up a bit. Oh, they look good. Serious amount of braking. Obviously, you're going to get braking effect from the regenerative, uh, regenerative braking from the actual electric motors. But one thing you've got to watch on a race car is uh, when the battery pack is full, you won't get any regen because essentially the battery pack don't want any more amps. So um, the regen level will drastically be reduced so that means on the first few corners and first lap if you like you'll have hardly any regen so you still need really good brakes but the other thing is if you have regen like high regen on a race electric race car the the battery pack doesn't get a break as far as cooling is concerned because you're taking lots of amps out of it when you're flooring it and then you put lots of amps back in when you're on regen so you know having some regen is good but not huge amounts of regen. So that's why you'll still need big brakes uh, on this car. So there we go. The brakes are now on. Right, I think that's enough for today. Um, so there's the latest update. I've still got a lot to do. I've got the rear brakes to sort out. Suspension. We're definitely going to need suspension, that's for sure. We'll, uh, we're going to take it down to a, a chassis dyno for that, which will be a really interesting episode for you. But before we even get to that point, we've got to finish off all the electrical sort of things, finish off some of the fab work as well, uh, and put the body on, obviously. So uh, there you go. Any questions on this build so far, let me know in the comments below. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed this video, and we'll see you on the next one.